Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Johnny Dunford. Uh, I work for BNP Power Real Estate. Uh, we look after occupiers, so our clients are people like Aviva, IBM, um, Post Office, and various others, so large corporates. And what I um, would like to share with you this morning is um, this theme of productivity. What is it and how do you get it? I have to say, it's great to be here. I'm very smart surroundings and great turnout, so thank you very much for the invitation, and I hope that um, I can share with you some useful thoughts. Um, there's time at the end for questions, so if you've got questions, please don't hesitate to, to fire away. So productivity, what, what is it and, and why are we concerned about it? I've used this slide a lot the last few years um, because I think every time we start talking about what's happening now and in the future, it's always good to look back a little bit. Um, it seems a very long time ago that we saw those guys coming out of various buildings on Wall Street and the like with their cardboard boxes um, when Lehman's went pop. It was seven years ago, property cycles are often said to be seven years, but hopefully the world really is different this time. But if we think back to how things were then, we had large floor plates, um, there wasn't really much talk about uh, wellness or uh, connectivity or collaborative working and the like, it was just about getting things done. And I think that's just an indicator of how things have moved on. So what's happening in the wider world before we get into this sort of thing of productivity? Um, it does feel, therefore, like we are talking about investing in a new cycle. And in my sort of thought process, it's not so much about investing in property, but about investing in the people and the space. And if we look what happened over this last recession, the traditional way of a business starting up in previous recessions was that you would start on the edge of town because it was cheap and you could get space cheaply and people just came to you. But actually this recession has been completely different in that what we've seen is small businesses starting up in the middle of town. And I would suggest the reason for that is because they want the quality of space, they want the quality of people, they want the quality of facilities that are all around. So two or three people huddled around a Starbucks table in the first instance, then progressing to something like a small Regis suite or a WeWork or something similar has become the norm. And that sort of idea of going to a dusty, um, dreary industrial park on the edge of town is very much out of vogue. So haven't things changed? And it's arguably about the facilities and the environment that we're providing. So it looks like we're in a, something of a bull market. Some people are telling you the market's topped out. There's certainly some big prices being paid around the property market, and particularly in London. But that ripple is, is taking, rolling outside of London and beyond. London remains a magnet for capital, but the, it is um, no doubt volatile. And I'll come on to that in a moment. In Europe, it feels like things are also on the, on the improvement side, um, led by uh, Germany and France, the two large economies, but again, not without uh, their problems. And some of this is borne out from this huge growth in urban population that we're seeing around the world, and something which is arguably now leading to this theme of mega trends, futures work, and the like. And no plug intended for the RICS, but if you haven't seen it, I would definitely recommend you go onto YouTube and plug in the RICS futures video, because it's a great story about what's going to be uh, affecting the world over the next 20 or so years. And this theme of population growth is everywhere, and it's leading to this huge trend of urbanisation. Megatrends, global cities, the names go on, it doesn't really matter what they are, but the overall trend is that more and more people are living in cities than they are in rural communities. So in China alone, there are 220 cities that are home to a million people. And in India, you could, it's much the same. It's a huge growth span. So, Taking a very quick example of that, here's Shanghai, um, top and bottom, separated by a mere 20 odd years, and that's what happens when economies and urban environments grow very rapidly. So you could say that's good for us in, in Europe and the UK. And there's been many political changes where we've seen political barriers coming down, freedom of movement, freedom of access, control and the like, which all point to um, much freer activity in Europe. Of course, we've got a referendum coming up, and who knows how that will spin out. But how about this one? This is Budapest, 
I lived in Budapest for, for three years. This is the central station um, over the period before Christmas last year. And this is a small country. It's also a small population in the city. The total population of the whole country is about three million. And the city, I think, on a good day might get to a million. And you've seen this massive rush of people all coming in to the centre of town and therefore causing disruption. Now, you know, why is all this important? It's important because I think that these trends that we are seeing are frankly something which is very new to all of us and something which has come out of the various products that went into um, the recession. Uh, I found a report the other day, um, which was a PwC one, um, which I'm just going to quickly hold up for you to have a quick look at. Uh, emerging trends in real estate. And a couple of the themes that pop out of that are what are being referred to as megatrends. Now, there is clearly a new generation, therefore, of occupier coming through. Much more sophisticated occupiers demanding much more of the space. And we've also seen growth into all sorts of new areas of property being used in a different way. So everybody's heard of private rented sector to try to meet this challenge of how do we house an ever-growing population. Leisure within the retail sector is now commonplace. You go to Westfield or any of the principal shopping centres and uh, retail and leisure are naturally intertwined. And so it's all about the experience. So what are the sort of mega trends that seem to be coming through which throw up this new generation? And I'm delib deliberately avoiding talking about millennials and the like. We were having a conversation earlier about what does it really mean and what do teenagers do when they're talking to their friends or others on the, uh, the various handheld devices. So the sort of mega trends that seem to be coming through that occupiers are responding to are access to transport and infrastructure. And go back to my earlier comments about small businesses setting up in the middle of town. Why is London so popular? Because it's got, in the main, pretty good transport and infrastructure. We can all complain about it, but by and large, it does work and it proves to be an ever-increasing draw for people wanting to find work. Flexible working, of course, remains a huge area of growth. Um, but again, traditionally, we talked about people working from home, and we thought that was going to be a huge panacea some years ago, and I'll come on to that shortly. And the theme of urbanisation, which I touched on uh, earlier. So looking at the occupier, it kind of looks like 20 years ago, we had tenants for buildings and very often they were on quite long leases. Now, lease terms have changed. There's a huge range of different options for occupying space. Today, most people talk about occupiers. Slightly different connotation, perhaps. And a prediction from some is that in 20 years' time, we will have guests. We need to look after those people who are occupying our buildings in a way just beyond providing them with a traditional shelter um, workspace. But of course, like everything, there's going to be some speed bumps along the way for all of the markets and difficult to predict where they're going to come from. Uh, I've mentioned referendums. We've got a new leader of the Labour Party. Uh, whether you love him or you hate him, he's there and he's the um, government's opposition and he clearly has his own views on the way things are going to work out. And so this all points to a different society and a different way of doing things. One thing seemed clear is we've got the rise of this hugely uh, demanding consumer population. Wherever you are, people are consuming and expecting great service very, very quickly and at a good price. And you think about our own experiences of buying goods online. We spend a few minutes looking online to buy something, we research a few options, we then decide to buy it and we're expecting uh, a very, very quick delivery and we're expecting perfect conditions of the goods when it arrives. And you could say that this sort of approach is now spilling across into the uh, way we do our work and the, the environment that we work within. I found a quote from the CEO of WeWork um, who's talking about life, of a, talking about the, um, the office model they run, and he describes his company as an energy business, a capitalist kibbutz, a physical social network, and one which really doesn't mention office or workspace at all. So that trend towards 
um, providing a service which is really all-encompassing and really, um, really one which goes beyond that traditional workspace seems to be the theme to go. So how do we start to measure the productivity? Because in the olden days, we measured the amount of time people spent at work, and 9 to 5 was a sort of standard regime. This was published by Forbes magazine a few years ago, and I think when they published it, everybody said, well, that's far too outrageous. Of course, we won't be commuting, and particularly not in the United States, where people love their motor cars. Why would you stop doing that? But of course, if we're going to be productive, we've got to start measuring different things. And I would suggest that we've been traditionally measuring the wrong things in the past. We've had this sort of wonderful office, which no one would admit to ever having worked in, but we can see it was clearly inefficient, far too many inputs, not enough controls, and what we were measuring. We were measuring the amount of space that were occupied by individuals um, in order to do their work. And I think Nigel's going to come onto this theme of measuring space and, and for example, inde indices like the IPD, which are very good in this respect, because you measure how many people are occupying a piece of space, and therefore, to a degree, you're measuring your productivity, although I would question whether you're measuring the right thing. We then went on to this theme of everybody working in a much more relaxed way. We had dress down Fridays. In some cases, we had the don't go to work at all on a Friday and sit at home on your veranda. Of course, this is highly desirable. I'm sure that very few people actually did it. But it didn't really work, did it? Because we did that, and we were then stuck with that same old problem. We'd measured the amount of space we'd occupied, and it had got better in that we were occupying less. But then we had this problem, that we were actually only occupying every other desk. And that does seem rather ridiculous, to be paying for two desks when only one person is occupying at any one time. We did some research work about a year ago now and asked um, modern companies, so media tech companies, what they wanted. And you can see from here that the thing that jumps out more than anything is that companies want modern space. Now, okay, this was 2014, but I don't think it really matters, frankly, um, because I think the, the, um, the mood is the same and the trend is the same. Um, and another pop popular sort of theme that um, everybody seems to get excited about uh, over the last few years was whether you had a fixed desk or you just had the ability for hot desking. And the same piece of research work we did um, show that actually, you can see here that the, the industry is broken down into what's called old school and new school. So uh, media tech industry, companies like, in the old, in the old school case, people like um, ITV and traditional print media, and in the uh, new school would be the Facebooks, Googles, um, Ubers, and so on. So you can see that, interestingly, the, the, um, the demand is actually towards fixed desks. So contrary to what our natural tendency would be to say that everybody wants to do um, hot desking. Okay, admittedly, this is a relatively small sample, and it's from the media tech industry, but it's one which is fast moving. It's not the case at all. There is a degree of permanence and comfort from having a fixed desk and a place from which you can do your work. Also, the theme of what does that office look like? Um, you're asking people what do they want out of uh, their office space. Well, when I do a quick glance at this, I sort of say to myself, well, with the exception of air conditioning, which in the modern day is absolutely standard, everything else is 50-50. The, the other obvious standout is location. You've got to be in the right place in order to be attractive to your workforce and in order to be productive. So that sort of leads us on to what um, we've been working on in the last uh, year or so, which is this theme of how to measure uh, the performance. Um, we've been working closely with uh, Leesman. Um, I'm not sure to what extent people are familiar with Leesman. If you are, can you put your hand up? Okay, so probably about half, maybe a bit more. And Leesman is a very simple survey tool, but like all things that are simple, it gives you a good result, which is that it tells you um, how effective the workplace is uh, for those that are working within it. As a quick intro to it, you get a score where red is bad and green is good, 
and you fit somewhere between the banding. The reason why the arrows are on there is because that is the current top and bottom of the range where the current database holds about 120,000 buildings and the bottom is um, 32.9 and the top is 84.6. So clearly a broad spread. But the nice thing about it is it's nice and simple and, and easy to read. And what you're doing in all of this is you are asking people what do they think about the place they work within and how effective is that place in supporting the function that they carry out. And so if, for example, you're involved in lots of meetings, you're measuring that. If you're involved in, for example, um, lots of detailed individual work, you're measuring that. And so the the, the big point for me is actually, rather obviously, um, property is all about the people. Um, it's very much an HR issue. If you're going to get productivity of a good uh, quality and a good standard, you've got to concentrate on what your people want. It's coming back to that sort of theme of how do we deliver services and space which is going to be uh, um, treating the occupier like a guest. This is the front page of the uh, Lease and Review magazine. It's a simple little um, newspaper type publication that comes out about four times a year. You can get it for free. Uh, it's entirely up to you, of course, whether you choose to take it, but it's worth a read. But if nothing else, it's slightly controversial and it's for free. So, you know, why not is my attitude. So how does it all work then? How does this Leaseman thing work and how do we use it uh, to measure productivity? Um, there's lots and lots of um, graphs and diagrams that come out of it, but very simply, it comes out looking like this. So you have um, a question which is simply, which activities to you are important in your work and how well are they supported? And you can look down the left-hand side and you can see what those um, various questions and facilities are. Now you can tailor this to suit the, the audience that you're going to. Um, the vast majority will be the same, I would suggest. So, for example, the top ones are like reading, audio conferences, telephone conversations, normally the same. There may be some um, more specific ones like video conferences, which are less applicable. And you give it a score, which then goes into the system where it comes out again, where um, red is bad, green is good, and the size of the bar reflects the overall level of importance. So you collect these up. Uh, the scoring system shows that dark red is not supported at all, red very undersupported, slightly more orange, undersupported, supported, well supported, until you get to the dark uh, green, which is very well supported. And you do this across the range of activities. So that was a, mostly on the green, this is mostly on the red. Uh, and you can see, for example, that you know, in this particular case, halfway down the screen, planned meetings and informal unplanned meetings are showing as being very red, which would imply that that particular workspace is not therefore supporting that activity and people are struggling to conduct that sort of um, event, that sort of activity. Likewise, at the bottom of the screen, video conferences, whilst not many people are saying it's something they need to do, the response is all red, which clearly means that it is not supported and therefore it's uh, inhibiting some people from doing their work. Now, Leesman, by their own uh, admission, simply do the survey. They provide, as they would describe, an x-ray. They go to a building, do the survey, provide the x-ray, and tell you what's going on. And it's presented like this. There's lots and lots of other charts which we could do, but to be honest, that would take up much more than 30-odd than minutes. So I'm just trying to provide a, a quick opening. Now, that's fine, but what... I've experienced is people say, well, we got a Leesman score of 55, for example, and they feel quite proud of themselves that they've got that. But you then ask an S question, which is, what did you do with that 55? And some people were simply satisfied to say, well, we got that score. You know, that was all we wanted. It was a benchmark. But really, there's much more that can be done because that simply gives you that mark in the sand, that, that indicator. It gives you a measure of effectiveness and productivity. So what we've done is we've taken the portfolio and then we do an analysis on it to say, well, what can we do in a simple way to present this to decision makers to make sure it really stacks up and really works? Now, the experience that we've had with our client base, and I'm 
and please shout out if you think this is, is not right, is it's really difficult to get the message through to the right people as to what is important and what is not. You can't be doing with lots of big heavy reports and so on because it simply doesn't get past the various boards and finance directors and so on that you're dealing with. Nine times out of ten, all they want is cheap property and they want it to work and that's as far as it goes. So you start to put it onto a simple chart. So this one, you can see, you know, maintain business revenue on the left-hand side is low, this one is high, rotate, promote, and you can populate the chart with the various sites as to what's important to the business. Um, and then you can do it likewise for the business functions. So whether it's um, trading, um, security, whatever the particular um, activities are. And you put them on according to the LMI, the Leesman score. I hope you can see that on that vertical line in the centre. Um, so that gives us a fairly simple summary. So what we've, we've done is put it into a series of charts, but we're trying to get it down to an absolute bare minimum of material because otherwise you don't get the message through quickly. So this is how it looks. You put it on one sheet, which is a combination of the business units, strategy, and the broad property stuff. So very simply, um, here's the business um, uh, priorities and activity and the, let's, be, let's be simplistic about this, what we're trying to do is align the property with the business aims and goals. Some simple stuff around the size of the asset, any particular um, lease events and so on, not applicable here because it's a freehold and then we put in here the broad um, lease and score results. So that's factual stuff, that's what you've got. The next page then, you summarise um, how it works from a strategy perspective. So you condense all of the material that you've got, put it into a good old SWOT chart, and then you make some deductions based on the scores you've got, how the property performs against um, the various criteria you have for lease events and other things, any sort of FM projects that are in there, are they, how much are they going to cost when they're going to come through, and you populate as well the leaseman. And of course, it's not something which you can do on your own. You need to do it in a little workshop type team. And so then you end up with some recommendations which are continue as is, develop further analysis, whatever it might be. So we're very simply trying to categorise the portfolio to make it work so that we can be truly uh, productive and truly effective. Now, that, that is a very simple analysis of and how it, it, it presents itself. What also happens in Leesman is you get a few anecdotes thrown out. So... Sometimes you get these odd comments that, that pop up. And a bit like, you know, on social media, Twitter and the like, you can catch all sorts of bits of useful information here because people don't naturally say things um, to your face or, or in a, um, in a um, meeting when they might do on a survey. So, you know, things here like, you know, coffee's not good quality at the bottom of the chart there. Well, coffee is always an issue for people, so if you're not providing good coffee, good quality coffee, you know, that can be a, a real um, letdown for staff. Um, you know, quite a trendy one there, we need some more electric vehicle charge points. Now again, these sort of things are not um, directives on their own, but what it is doing is pointing you in the direction of where things ought to go. So that's part of the package which, which um, lends itself to then shaping the strategy. So why are we doing all of this? Well, very simply, you want to get a good score where people in the workforce are saying, this workplace really enables me to work productively. And that is the overall aim in all of it. So I'm coming towards the, the end of the, the presentation. What I've tried to do is just capture what's happening in the wider picture. We are no longer concerned so much about providing space as providing a range of facilities, an environment in which people can operate and they need to do so productively. We're employing fewer of them, they're more expensive, they're more demanding, their lifestyle is completely different and therefore we've got to move with it. And if we don't measure that, we can't get that productivity up. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much.